Join us this morning as we look at John chapter 1 verses 43 to 52 and discuss Philip and Nathaniel's call from Jesus. Hearing God's call, God's call is simple, but God's call is profound. Two psychiatrists met at their 20th uh, anniversary at college and one was vibrant while the other was worn out and tired. The one that was worn out asked the first, the vibrant one, what's your secret? He said, listening to other people's problems every day, caring about them, struggling with them, sharing with them, it's worn me out. I feel already that I'm an old man. So, the other psychiatrist said, who listens? That's a little bit about what goes on in our world today. We're all so busy with everything around us. We're busy receiving information from the television, from the computer, from our telephones. We're busy with our commitments to work and to family and to school. We're running around all the time, trying to grab meals when we can, shoveling it down as quick as possible, moving on to the next thing. We live in a very rapid, a fast-paced world. And some we get so overwhelmed by the commitments and the pace of life around us with our spouses or our children or all of it, we can become a little snippy with each other, can't we? Not that we don't love each other, but sometimes we just don't have the time. Sometimes we're so frazzled by the hectic pace of life that it's easy to set us off. That's the world we live in today. And in that world, we're finding more and more that it's harder and harder for people to listen to each other. Well, we hear what people are saying, but it doesn't necessarily sink in. The words go into our minds, but the meaning behind them sometimes gets lost. And what does it take then to listen? Listening is really an intentional thing that we have to do, isn't it? Listening means that I have to take a step back from this crazy busy world. It means that if I want to hear what my wife is saying to me, I have to put things aside and listen to her. Listening is like tuning in a radio station. It's hard when you're between stations and you have two stations playing at once. You don't really catch anything and you become overwhelmed and frustrated. Listening is tuning in intentionally to that one station so that I put away my sermon outline, I step away from the dishes or my project, and my attention is on my wife. And then I can listen to her carefully understand her words and the meaning behind them and we communicate. If I don't do that, she likes to tease me sometimes when I don't do that, that all I'm hearing is dolphin squeaks. <laughs> it's true. It's true. And listening for a Christian is especially important. This morning, we see in the New Testament, in the Gospel lesson, that Jesus has now returned from his baptism, temptation in the wilderness, and has gone past where John was baptizing. And John, at that time, said to his disciples, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus came by a second time and he not only said that to his two disciples who were with him on the next day, John and Andrew, but he told them about the baptism of Jesus and the heavens were opened and the Spirit of God descended like him upon him like a dove and God had said upon the man whom the dove descends, this is he, the Messiah, the Christ. Those two disciples had gotten up and followed Jesus to where he was staying and stayed with him all that day. And you know what they did? Andrew, having been so excited to sit and hear and listen to Jesus with undivided attention, 
He got up and went and found his brother Simon and brought him back. And Jesus said to him, I'm going to call you Peter. And not only did Andrew find Simon Peter, but John went and found his brother James. Now today, Jesus is preparing to go to the wedding at Cana back in Galilee. And as he does, he's busy about his preparations and he runs across Philip. Now Jesus never accidentally runs across anybody, does he? By design, he went and he found Philip. And what does he say in our text this morning? Nothing elaborate, something actually very simple. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Follow me. God's call is rather very simple. In the busyness of the world around us, and maybe at that time it was a quite a busy world too, it's very easy for us to not listen to God who talks to us because we're so focused on things, aren't we? We've got to focus on our job. We've got to focus on our bills. We've got to focus on our family. We have to focus on this and that and the other thing. And we're busy running around doing the things that life requires. But sometimes God and those things spiritual kind of fall into the background. Don't take the priority that God would have us to have. Philip, however, on this day, heard and listened to the call of Jesus. Follow me. Philip, like the others, very likely a disciple of the baptizer, did follow Jesus. It says that he was from the city of Bethsaida, as were the other, other two uh, uh, disciples from that region. Bethsaida is on the north and to the east of the Sea of Galilee. See, the Jordan River runs down north into the sea, and at that time, Bethsaida sat in a little lagoon where the river emptied out before it went right into the Sea of Galilee. It was one of the four beautiful cities on the Sea of Galilee. Pliny the Elder, a man at that time, a Roman, said of the city, it was a well-known town. Maybe we're trying to, being told that we should understand, first of all, Philip being from Galilee knew a little bit about Jesus and the work that he is doing and the miracles that, well, he would perform. He had not yet. Maybe it means Philip was a little apprehensive of this man. Because you see, the call of God is not only simple. Looking outwardly from a worldly perspective at Jesus' words, they don't seem like much. Follow me. And Jesus himself, to look at him, he looks just like an ordinary guy. There's nothing remarkable, the scripture says, that he should be catching our attention. And yet, from God's heavenly perspective, the words that come from the mouth of Jesus are miraculous words filled with power that can enter the heart and there by that word and the working of the Holy Spirit in that human heart transform it. Paul says, we were born dead already in our trespasses and sins, but this life-giving word transforms that dead heart into something beating and alive, filled with faith. And the eternal life that God gives through the forgiveness of sins. From God's perspective, the words of Jesus are a dynamo of power. Philip went off to find Nathaniel, friend of his. Nathaniel, interestingly enough, was from Cana, where Jesus was now about to go, where he would perform his very first miracle. Nathaniel was skeptical. What did Philip do? What does the Bible say to us today? He says, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. 
You see, Jesus had been foretold from the beginning of time. Moses, the first five books of the Bible, talks several times about the coming of this Savior, the Messiah, who would save the world from its sins. We have found the one about whom Moses wrote in the law and about whom the prophets have foretold. He is Jesus coming out of the town of Nazareth. He is the son, as it was supposed, it says in the scripture, of Joseph, the carpenter. Nathaniel is a little bit incredulous. In fact, you might catch a little bit of, of satirical bite in his comment. He says, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Maybe a little town rivalry. What was Nathaniel saying, really? That little town near Cana, nothing good could come out of that town. Nothing remarkable, no one remarkable could come out of a little town like that. Well, Philip says just the right thing to him. He doesn't try to use elaborate arguments. You can never argue anyone through human logic and reason to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He simply uses Three little words that Jesus himself had used with John and Andrew. Come and see. And Nathaniel did. He came to see Jesus. But look at what it says. As Nathaniel approached Jesus, even before he reached him, Jesus said to those standing beside him, here is a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. Not a Jew, an Israelite. What is an Israelite? And why does Jesus remark about Nathanael that he is truly an Israelite? Because you see, an Israelite is the very best of what God has given in his covenant. An Israelite is someone who is filled with faith in God. An Israelite is someone who lives under the covenantal blessing of God and does all that is required. Doesn't mean he's perfect. Nobody's ever going to be perfect. And how often have we seen that in our own lives and the lives around us? But he lived by faith in the promise of the coming Son of God, the Savior of the world. Behold, a true Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Now, Nathaniel overheard that. You can imagine how surprised he was at that. And here we see that faith and the call of God is not simply something simple, but it's also very profound. How do you know me so well, Nathaniel said. How do you know me so well? While you were still under the fig tree, I saw you. Because God not only knows who we are, he sees us inside and out. He knows our heart as well. Nathaniel had withdrawn to pray and worship God under the, the spreading branches of the fig tree that morning out of the sun and Jesus saw him there because Nathanael was speaking to him you see Nathanael was worshiping God and the scripture tells us and the witnesses of those who were with him that Jesus Christ is God earlier in chapter 1 of John he says that Jesus is the word wrapped in human flesh Jesus had heard his prayer. Jesus knew him intimately, just as intimately as God knows you. He knows everything about you. He knows what you had for breakfast. He knows what you were doing this morning as you were getting ready to come to church. He knows what you think about everything 
He knows where you go and what you do. He knows your past and he knows your future. He knows you entirely. And that doesn't need to be a bad and scary thing. Although we have to say, Lord, I'd rather you not know that I had said that or I had done that. But you know, the Lord is love. Love. And because he loves you, because he loves you, he sent you Jesus Christ. And although God is serious when he says do this and don't do that, and we oftentimes break that word of God and go astray in our rebellion against him, he continues to love us despite ourselves. And he comes to find us where we are. And through the gospel of Jesus, he reveals himself to us. And through the Word of God and the working of the Holy Spirit in your life, God enables you to hear His call. Because the call of God is received in the heart when God creates faith and opens the ears of the soul to hear His call to you. In the Old Testament, God called out to Samuel. Samuel, before you were born, God called your name. Before you were born, God called you to faith in him. And maybe many of us came to faith when mom or dad or mom and dad brought us up to the font and there listening to the words of Jesus that we should be baptized, the pastor poured water over your head and said, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Words that are so simple that we can all confess, but words so profound. Because in John chapter 3, Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must be born again of water and the spirit of such is the kingdom of God. And in those simple actions of water and the word, God transformed you into his child. Or maybe as an adult, you've heard the call of God reading the word of God in the Bible, hearing the scripture shared with you by someone you care about or someone that you work with. And he came to you as a grown-up and in his love he opened your heart and you heard his call, the call to faith. And having heard his call, the word working through the Spirit, you responded and said, yes, Lord, I believe. And you came to faith because faith isn't knowing just the facts of who Jesus is and what he came to do, as important as that is. Faith is taking the words, Jesus died for the sins of the world, and saying with meaning, Jesus died for my sins. And there God created in you a living faith. And you became his child. And his love has enveloped you ever since. It doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done or what you've said or what you've thought. In Christ, you receive the gifts that are belonging to faith. And that's the profoundness of the miracle. For God gives you the righteousness that belongs to Jesus who lived a perfect life when we couldn't. And he covers you in your baptism and in faith with that righteous robe of his righteousness. And he says, you are mine. And when the Father looks at you, he declares you forgiven of all your sin and the guilt of that sin. Because when he sees you, he sees his son, Jesus. God's love for you is very real. And God has called you to follow him wherever he may lead, we be. But we do know 
where we will end up because of that call, because you have heard the call to faith, because you have believed in him whom God has sent, you will end up with the Father in that place which he has prepared before the foundation of the world. You will leave this world of trial and struggle, of haste and waste, and end up with Christ in the joy of paradise. That is a certain promise. Jesus said to Nathanael, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You shall see greater things than that. And then he added, speaking to all of them, I tell you the truth, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Maybe that takes us back to the baptism when heaven was opened and the Father spoke and the Spirit descended on Christ. But there's more to it than that. The opening of heaven to believers is the gift of God in Christ and Jesus refers to the vision of Jacob. In Genesis 28, when he lay down his head near the city of Luz, and there had a vision of God, a stairway planted on the earth, reaching up into heaven. And at the top of the stairway, the father looking down, speaking words of love and comfort to him and reaffirming him in that covenant relationship. And Jesus is saying, I am the stairway. Your eyes will be opened. And you will see that I am the one whom Jacob saw. I am the one who connects heaven and earth. I am the mediator. I am the Christ. I am the Savior. And what will they see and perceive by faith? Not only the miracles that he will do, not only the teaching that he will proclaim of God's forgiving love in Christ, but they will see the salvation of the world. They will stand at a distance and see the Christ hanging on the cross. The sacrifice and the priest all wrapped in one to be the atonement for the sins of the world. And they will see heaven opened and they will behold the resurrection of Jesus. And they, in the assurance of life eternal, will carry the message of the cross and all that they have seen to the ends of the earth. As Jesus has given to us that privilege as well. How much does God love you with an everlasting love? Don't allow yourself, dear Christian friends, brothers and sisters, to allow the world to overwhelm you. Don't allow your listening ears to be closed to the Word of God. Don't let it slip behind you and become less important in your life. But by the power of God and the faith that He has given you, Open that word each day. Read the message that God has put there for you to read. Know in that message that he loves you with a love beyond all description. And that he, by the power of his spirit in that word, will carry you beyond all the trials and the tribulations and the struggles of this world to the joy and everlasting peace that is already yours in the gift of heaven. Are you listening to his call? I know you are. And now Jesus says, follow me. In Christ's name, amen. If you'd like to hear more on this topic or any other, please contact us or join us Sunday mornings for worship at 9 o'clock, Bible class at 1030.